thank you. Um, delight to be here, uh, even if it is a Saturday morning. Um, I've actually been, been looking forward to this for um, almost a year. Uh, believe it or not, it was, uh, and, and she doesn't actually believe me, but I remember it was, it was in London uh, last November that Vicki asked me, uh, you know, we happened to meet up when she was there, and she said, if we asked you to keynote at Python Ireland, would you do it? And I thought she was joking. Um, why don't you suggest me? But in any case, I said, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And then sure enough, this spring, uh, I heard back, and it's like, well, yes, we really meant it. So uh, it's actually a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to, to start maybe with a quick disclaimer here. Uh, I have included, as you'll see down at the bottom of, of this particular slide, uh, and you can frantically jot it down if you care, uh, a link to the slides, because they're on uh, Google Slides. Uh, I also need to tell you that there is really, honestly, virtually nothing on the slides. Uh, so if you can do this if it makes you feel good, but in fact, I sort of believe that um, PowerPoint style slides are kind of an anti-pattern for communication. Uh, that, that's at least my excuse, so I tend to do pretty sparse slides. So you're probably just as far ahead to uh, go ahead and, and, and listen to this. So my talk today, um, which actually follows greatly on the opening, um, I, I, it all seems to be fitting together. My talk today is inspired by two quotes. And uh, the first one is from Brett Cannon, who's uh, been a longtime core developer of the Python community. And when he was giving the opening remarks uh, for uh, Python US in Montreal in 2014, he had a few minutes to, as he put it, opine. Uh, and one of the first things he said is, well, I don't know about the rest of you, but the way I look at it is, I came to Python for the language, I stayed for the community. Uh, and honestly, I think that that particular sentiment has resonated with uh, a lot of us. It certainly resonated with me. Um, the second quote is actually only a few days old, uh, and it comes from Tim Schweiger, who has done a lot of work, particularly with gender diversity in technology. Uh, he is not uh, a member of the Python community. Uh, he actually is working more in Haskell these days, I believe. Uh, but he had a, uh, a blog post uh, a few days ago. And for this one, actually, we go to the Google Slides. It's down in the speaker notes, the link to this. Uh, the, uh, where he talked about um, doing community work. And one of his points is that we cannot get anything done technically unless we can come together and cooperate as a community. Therefore, um, community work should really count as being as, as every bit as much a part of the process as uh, technical work. Uh, so that actually spares me from doing a disclaimer that, oh, this isn't going to be a technical talk. If we take Tim's definition, then I am, in fact, giving a technical talk. Um, so I am going to start by telling you a little bit of the story of, of, of my involvement with the Python community, because I think uh, it does uh, illustrate what I'm talking about a little bit. And in fact, it, it, that happens to be a story that I know, so that, that's also useful. Uh, I will try to keep this from, from turning too much into a, uh, so tell us about the old and the grandma's speech, but it probably will happen a little bit. Uh, and the reason that it will be that way, I'm afraid, is that I am old, <laughs> okay? Uh, in fact, I am, uh, this, this is me on a good day. Uh, so uh, I, I have been around uh, in, in tech communities for a while, let's say. Uh, and to, to give you an idea of this, uh, I am not going to attach any years to these things. Uh, <laughs> people guess wrong about my age all the time. I'd like that to continue quite very much. Uh, so I started using computers on a, uh, a Sperry Univac uh, 1108. At least I think that's what it was as far as I can go back digging through the archaeological records. That seems to have been it. 
Uh, I was not a computer science person at the time. Uh, I was uh, actually finishing a PhD in classics at uh, the University of Wisconsin at the time, and they decided to let a few of us uh, sort of token humanities folks into the computer center to work on our dissertations as, I don't know, I guess they were trying to spread the word, something like that. Uh, we had glorious technology at the time, the state of the art. We had line editors, but not only that, we had editors that would do a whole page at a time before you saved it. We thought we were so cool. In fact, at the very end of my time there, as I was finishing my dissertation, a revolutionary thing occurred. We got for the University of Wisconsin a laser printer. Uh, it was beautiful. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, and, and I will say that we were very lofty using those editors. Uh, at this point, the punch card machines had all been sort of pushed off to the side, but they were still there and they were still used occasionally. Um, after that, I actually switched to, to the Apple IIs uh, and, and did some, some things on the Apple IIe and the IIc. Uh, as it happened, I was, uh, I taught in uh, Athens, Greece for a couple of years and uh, ended up with an Apple IIc that had the Greek character Ramcha. Uh, and this was a lot of things. They had a little button, and this, this was designed for international markets. Had a little button, and you hit it, it would switch character sets. Uh, or if the weather was hot and the machine got a little flaky, which did happen from time to time in Greece, it would randomly switch back and forth between the characters. That was, that was a lot of fun. Uh, and I learned to program in Applesoft Basic, as, as some of us old timers did. Uh, and then I actually learned 6502 Assembler. In fact, for a while, yes, all right. So, yeah. In fact, for a while, I had the book that Apple published with the printout of the disassembly of the Apple IIc ROM. And you can read it and look for little, weird little things to exploit or something like that. Uh, there's absolutely no point to my telling this at all, except that I find it It would be illegal today. It would be illegal today, that's probably true. Um, and, and sadly, I think I, I donated or threw it away. Well, I'm, again, I'm not mentioning numbers. Uh, so, uh, I eventually ended up at a school, uh, a small uh, private school in uh, Indiana in the United States. Uh, and that was where I actually started writing what I loosely call production code. Uh, it was production code in that I was not the only one using it. I ended up writing uh, grading systems and report systems and things like that at the school. And um, ended up uh, learning C, which I thought was interesting. Uh, we had to handle a lot of student records, and those were in DBase 3 Plus, which was a real joy. Again, there are a few of the others like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've never been there. Um, and, um, then eventually, uh, they decided that it was easier to find a new Latin teacher than it was to find somebody else to do computer stuff. And they told me, look, stop teaching Latin. We'll worry about that. Uh, we want you to work on, on the computer systems and teach computing. So, so that's what I did. And I ended up writing more stuff. I graduated to C++, which I, I thought was really interesting at the time. Uh, there were a lot of headaches, which I just must have enjoyed. I, I honestly don't know. Uh, and doing things in, in Visual Basics, both for Windows and for DOS. I don't know of anybody else who's actually written VB DOS programs, uh, but I in fact have. Uh, so, uh, uh, Harold doesn't believe me. Yes, they did have a DOS version. No, it was, it, was, it was a descendant of Quick Basic, but it actually did have the form system and everything. Kind of like uh, Visual Basic meets Curses or something like that. Uh, so, so yeah, all, all of those things. And as I say, at the time I was teaching because in our school we had a requirement that everybody to graduate from the high school had to take uh, a computer class. And this was a year-long computer class. About half of that involved programming. Uh, so everybody who graduated from this school uh, had to write programs. Uh, and uh, when I first started doing this, we were still teaching in, in Turbo Pascal, uh, Turbo Pascal 3 or something like that. Uh, and, well, it was okay. I mean, it wasn't great, but Pascal's not a terrible language at the time. 
But it was starting to show its age, so I decided that maybe I would teach it in C a time or two. This wasn't as bad, yeah, I saw somebody go, this wasn't as bad as I expected. But of course, the thing is, on the horizon at that point was Java. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the American system, they have something called an advanced placement exam, which is uh, a way to get a college credit as a, a, you know, a, a student finishing school. Uh, you can you know, take a course and then take an exam. If you do well enough, then the colleges or universities will say, okay, yeah, you can go out one semester or, or something like that. So they were switching that to Java. So clearly the writing was on the wall. I was going to have to start teaching every kid in that school Java. This was not something I was looking forward to. So all of that really is sort of set up to see, to let you see that I was really ready for something new in, in the language world uh, at this time. Uh, and in fact, uh, in, uh, in 2001, uh, Nathan Dirkler, who was, was working with me at the time uh, as an assistant, I, and I uh, got to go to Linux World in, uh, in San Francisco. And uh, our headmaster was, was not a particularly generous sort when it came to travel and conference money. He said we could either go for the two days of tutorials before, or we could go for the conference itself. Uh, and so we decided that we would rather go through the tutorials. Uh, and as it happened, for well, one of those days, there was this guy, Guido Van Rossum, who had created this language Python that people were starting to talk about a little bit, although you really couldn't find anybody who had used it much. Uh, but he was, he, he, was, he was doing a day-long tutorial on this Python language. I thought, well, you know, that, that sounds like a fairly interesting thing to sit in. I, I, yeah, I guess, I guess I'll do that. So um, I actually went to, to Guido's tutorial. Uh, for reference, this was when 2.1, Python 2.1 was just out. So Guido spent a lot of time saying, don't use 2.0, don't use 1.6, whatever. 2.1, this is the one you're supposed to use. Uh, and um, Pythoneers, as they were called at the time, were scarce enough that actually, and this I didn't know at the time because I wasn't a Pythoneer at the time, uh, but I, I discovered a post that, that Guido had put out at the time saying, gee, you know, do you think there are going to be enough Pythoneers at Linux World in San Francisco that we might have a meetup? I mean, this was a conference of like 10,000 people. So it, things were, were pretty, pretty rare. Um, so uh, as I say, I went, I went to that uh, and I was, I was really kind of amazed uh, at the language. I mean, I recall, I'm sure nobody else cared at the time, you know, you always recall these things personally. I recall asking several, like, really stupid questions of Guido at the time. Um, I think one of them was coming from the C world. I was really kind of completely blown away by Python's implementation of strings. Like, okay, first of all, I can't just go in and change the individual character in the string. I can't do that, okay. Now that was sort of hard. And then the fact that, you know, each character was a string itself. Whoa, that's kind of classic, you know? Uh, so uh, all of these things struck me as strange coming from the C world. But it, uh, it did strike me as a really good idea. Uh, and in fact, uh, as we flew back on the plane, and Nathan remembers this as well, uh, I ended up rewriting half of our course uh, on the plane into Python from, from C, Java, you know, the various other things that we use. Uh, and it was really easy, and it's like, wow, this is great. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the short story is that we were there in, in August, I think, by the time we got to uh, mid-September, and we actually started teaching programming, we were teaching programming in Python. Uh, it's, it's kind of a luxury when you work at a little small school like that. You can kind of just do what you want to do and, uh, you know, explain later. I guess this is, is my first, my first a application in the Python world of it's easier to ask for forgiveness. Uh, so I did that, and in fact we also, this, this quote comes from uh, a senior student who had gone through the Java Advanced Placement course, and then we offered an, an advanced Python thing for those kids who knew how to program and had finished. 
And I was walking down the hall one day, and, and, and heard somebody running after me, and I was like, duck, duck, duck. And I was like, what? And he's like, oh, I can't believe it. And I'm like, what? I cannot believe that you taught us Java when you knew, you knew that something like Python existed. <laughs> uh, so uh, that, that was sort of the student reaction to, to switching to Python. Uh, and in fact, we, we sort of pretty much used it throughout our curriculum. Um, but you know, it wasn't just teaching it, we also used it at the school. So in fact, um, when you're at a small school, particularly in those days, software is expensive, Doing it what you want to do with any software is always a problem. Uh, and you know, there's always this, this, this sort of dilemma. Do you take what's off the shelf? That means you change everything about what you do to match the software. Uh, do you make software to match what you do, which means you have sort of a, a, a custom installation? Well, since we had no money, I wanted something like what Blackboard was, except Blackboard was, still is in my opinion, awful in many ways and expensive. So um, I actually stumbled on uh, this Zoc 2. Uh, and how many of you, just out of curiosity, so I can see just how archaic I am, how many of you know of Zoc? OK, this was before Plone. OK, or rather, Plone was just starting out. There was, there was almost nothing on Plone these days. And, and so I started using Zoc. Uh, and I spent two or three months beating my head against the documentation. It was, at the time, I think the worst documentation experience I've ever run into. And if there's a worse one, please don't tell me. I don't want to know. Uh, and, and we created, um, uh, in, in 2002, I actually launched uh, the beginnings of a student information system running in Zoom. Uh, I haven't been working at that school now for nearly five years. Uh, I actually went back and checked last night. Thirteen years after I started it, that application is still running, still on Zoom 2. Uh, again, I have no particular reason to tell you that except, hey, that's weird. Um, so, and, 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 and Cherry Pie, these are, again, this was before Django was out there. This is before Flask. These, this is before things like that. So I also wrote uh, web applications in Cherry Pie, did a lot of database manipulation, all of that. Uh, all of which is to say that um, when I found Python as a language, it really, really solved a lot of problems for me, uh, even back in the olden times. Uh, and um, I really sort of uh, found the language in, in many ways very useful, both as a teaching language and both as a practical language. So, you know, yes, indeed. I mean, I, I think I clearly fit this pattern as a lot of people I talk to do. Uh, when I came to Python, it was the language that drew me in and really got me started. But I think I would have to agree that it was the community uh, aspect that um, actually made me stay around, or, or drew me in even more. Uh, so um, as it happened, um, Nathan and I, uh, who sort of felt like we were the only Python programmers in the world up in a corner of northeastern Indiana in the US, um, we actually learned that um, in 2003, there was going to be a Python conference, uh, which seemed like a great idea. Uh, this guy who's sitting back over there, uh, yes, Steve Holden was actually uh, a, one of the organizers uh, leading the organization effort for the very first PyCon. And we put in a paper that was accepted. And um, I remember going to my headmaster, again, the guy who was really terribly keen on conferences and travel. I've uh, been saying, oh, sir, we, we've been accepted to go to this very first PyCon conference. We're really excited, we really love going. <laughs> Okay, so how much are they paying you? Uh, like, well, actually, it's a community conference, so they're not paying us at all. It's like, well, no, that's, that's okay, it's understandable. So, um, how much of their expenses are they paying for it? It's like, well, sir, it's a community conference, so actually, they're not. Uh, and, and this got a little bit worse. It's like, well, so, you know, at least they're giving you a free registration, right? I was like, well, um, but we were accepted and all of that, so he did let us go. And, and we spoke with the first couple of icons. Uh, 
which, which were really great for us because we actually being sort of stuck off on our own. My community was much smaller in those days. It was really great to get together and actually see that there were other people. There were actually other people in the world who were using Python at schools, which we found amazing. Uh, so, so we did that. Uh, I continued to teach. Uh, we actually, uh, I, I sort of led a group of teachers who put together some patches for the Turtle Library. Uh, right before it was completely replaced by Gregor Lingle's better Turtle Library, but we were, we were in there for Python 2.5. Um, eventually, uh, I ended up um, foolishly asking self-same Steve Holden if there was anything I could do for the PSF, and he told me, yes, I'd like a poster session of PyCon, please. Uh, and uh, he's laughing back there because he knows it's true. Uh, so I ended up doing the poster session of PyCon. Uh, along the way, I ended up uh, doing the uh, uh, second edition of the Quick Python book which, if I ever get some time, might become the third edition. You never can tell. Uh, and and what, what strikes me as, as completely inexplicable, uh, I was voted in as a, a member of the, the Python Software Foundation. So uh, what I'm saying is that I ended up with a, a, a lot more from uh, the Python community, I think, than just the language. I mean, clearly, the language was the starting point. If it wouldn't have been a good language, I don't think I would have put the time in. But in fact, uh, there were a lot of things that sort of came uh, from being involved with the community. Um, and in fact, I think as far as, as my, my story goes, um, I think the key thing was actually um, my interactions with the Python community when uh, I honestly expected that they would have to end. Um, as, as many of you may have heard, and if not, well, that's fine too. Um, a few years ago, uh, I came to the point where I had to face the fact that, that I was transgender and transitioned. Um, not to put too fine a point on it, I had for decades told myself if I could just survive until I died, it would be okay. And I then realized that I wasn't really hanging on and it wasn't really okay. Uh, and so I felt at that point, and the only way I could make that transition would be to leave the Python community because that was the narrative that I had always heard. That was the only way that people used to do it. You went underground, joined the witness protection program. Uh, and that was very sad, so I actually created the uh, Python Education Summit was meant to be the last thing I would do for the Python community. Uh, the only problem was I couldn't bring myself to leave uh, so when I actually started telling people what I wanted to do in the Python community, they were some of the first people I told, uh, they actually made it, what should I say, they made it impossible for me to leave. They, they did not want me to leave. Uh, and that support coming at that time in your life, I mean, it's really um, pretty hard, I think, to describe what it feels like to sort of openly declare membership in what's arguably one of the more reviled communities of the world. Um, so, you know, the, the fact that, that, that um, I was encouraged to stay there, in fact, I think the thing that mattered most was I was working on the Education Summit for, for Python US when this happened, and I kept right on working on it, and people kept right on wanting me to work on it. And that, I think, was a very key thing in that um, the contribution that I was making was accepted and encouraged and welcomed and all of that, even as those changes were going on. So, you know, and then again, I think maybe many people have, have different stories, but it probably comes down to a lot of people have something up in their life. And um, the presence of a community that wants you to stay engaged is just hugely, hugely important. Um, so, you know, what, what, what do I think is, is behind that sort of special quality of the Python community? And I do think it, it, it's a special quality. Well, I mean, the obvious thing is that there are lots of ways that you can engage. Um, we've got mailing lists, we've got many IRC channels, there are meetups, um, Python Software Foundation will even fund your, your meetup fees if you want to start a, a, a something like that. There's PyLadies, it's the Django Girls Initiative, which has, has taken the entire world by storm. 
Um, there are various sprints that happen uh, either with conferences or without. There are PyCons. This one, I was in PyCon Poland last weekend, uh, all over the place. I think you could probably do, and, and maybe if somebody has lots of money sometime, they will do this, do a, Py, a PyCon every week for a year or something like that. You know, <laughs> yeah, no. uh, it's amazing. But, um, you know, and, and part of that too is that it, it's a global community. Um, at this point, uh, of course, North America and Europe have always been pretty well represented in, in, in the Python world. But uh, increasingly, we have uh, Pythons being started in Latin America. Uh, there's going to be a Python in the Caribbean uh, in February. You may have heard about that. Uh, in Africa, uh, there's going to be a Python in Namibia. And they're working in Cameroon, in Nigeria, in various places like that. Uh, across Asia and, and, and Australia and everywhere else. So, so that there's, there's a lot of things here, I guess. Again, my personal story here is that when I moved to London um, a little bit over uh, 18 months ago, um, you know, London does not have the reputation, I don't think, in the world of being like just sort of a, a friendly small town or whatever. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, if you're the Python community, it kind of is. I mean, from, from almost the moment I landed, I knew people. Uh, somebody's like, here, let me take you out for, for a drink to welcome you to town. Uh, so by knowing people in the Python community, um, I was already at home uh, in, in a new city. And I, I think that works all over. Um, if, if you are active and if you engage in, in uh, the Python community, you usually end up with friends from, from a lot of different places. Um, and of course, um, I think it probably goes without saying, if we weren't inclusive, I wouldn't be standing here. Um, so the Python community has been a leader amongst uh, tech communities for being inclusive. And, and there are some parts to that. I mean, diversity is, is one of those things. Uh, so having different people <laughs> in the room is sort of the first step there. Um, I think as, as any of us who know, I know who, I guess any of us who might count ourselves as being diverse, uh, you know, sort of know this, this is not likely to happen unless uh, the environment uh, is respectful, unless it feels safe. Uh, this is something I think that a lot of other communities get wrong, they miss that part. If you don't feel safe, if you don't feel respected, it doesn't matter if they say you can show up, you're not going to. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I know in talking to people who are in uh, the Ruby and JavaScript communities and things like that, uh, Scala, another one, uh, that, that they don't always feel that way. Uh, I do know that people who are from any sort of marginalized group are thinking, no, I can do this technology stuff, where am I going to start? Uh, they will think, well, you know, I think probably I would be, be you know, best off in the Python community. This is, a, this is a very powerful, powerful thing that we've got here. Uh, and of course, part of that is driven by the fact that we um, are also really sort of the world leaders in uh, the sort of the application of a code of conduct. Uh, I know that in tech communities sometimes the whole subject of code of conduct can be sort of divisive when it comes up. Uh, honestly, if you are a marginalized person, uh, a code of conduct is one of the first things you look for. It's no guarantee particularly, but at least it's a start. Uh, certainly when I was thinking of how my life would be like after I transitioned in the Python world and could I stay, uh, looking at codes of conduct was one of the first things that I did. Uh, and in fact, uh, the PSF won't, uh, won't fund uh, any conference that doesn't have uh, a code of conduct. So, so this is really a big deal. And then the last thing, and this is the thing that um, I think people don't pay attention to enough, and it's quite often a thing that, that communities get wrong. Uh, in, in the Python community, and, and, and again, when I'm speaking of Python community, I'm speaking from here,
from the local meetup level all the way to, to the entire global community. Um, if you cannot contribute, if your contribution is not welcomed and valued, you are going to leave. Okay? As I said, there are many, many uh, tech communities where this isn't true. Open source communities, theoretically, this is supposed to be true. Okay? Don't look too closely and say the Linux kernel community. I'm just saying. Uh, so, so, in general, and again, we're not perfect. I think this is a place where, where we need to strive much harder. But in general, in Python, if you want to contribute something, whether that something is code, I mean, if you go in as a complete beginner and suggest uh, a, a reworking of, of the Python core, that's probably not going to go too well. But certainly, you're, you're at least allowed to enter into the conversation. But if, if, you, if that's code, that's fine. But if it's also working on the community side of things, uh, in general, people are pretty welcoming and, and pretty much appreciating this, this contribution. That's certainly what I found. Uh, again, when I ended up in the UK, um, I sort of ended up working on uh, Icon UK. Um, none of this, oh, you're a stranger, you're coming in and trying to tell us something. It's like, well, no, I've done a poster session before. You want a poster session? Yes, great. Uh, so, so that you can contribute. And, and I think this is... Um, a huge, huge thing. Uh, and, and it's also very necessary, in fact, because having done some, some of this community work, it gets very tiring. The same person cannot do it over and over and over again. We need to have more people helping out. Uh, and we need to continue to work on, on fostering this spirit that, yes, you can come in and contribute. It gives everybody ownership. It, it helps build the community. Uh, it is, in fact, one of the more satisfying parts of being engaged in the community. So, all of that stuff that I've talked about, who does that? Well, I mean, of course, the first answer is we all do that. Um, the second answer is that um, the Python Software Foundation does do some things to, to help out with this as well. Uh, and. and that, that's sort of where I'm here officially as, as, as the cheerleader, I guess. Um, the mission of the Python Software Foundation is to protect, promote, protect, and advance the Python programming language, support, and facilitate the growth of a diverse and international community of Python programmers. So the Python Software Foundation is sort of the, the, the organization that, that is sort of charged, or charges itself, however you want to look at it, uh, with looking after the Python language and the Python community. And I want to explain a little bit what that might mean and what it doesn't mean. Um, so the Python Software Foundation is responsible for the intellectual property of the Python language. Uh, of course, we have members. And the third thing that we have is money. I want to tell you a little bit about what we do with this. So for intellectual property, um, the Python Software Foundation, the PSF, has the licenses for all of the bits that make up Python. Okay? That doesn't mean that, they, that we own the copyright or that we own the intellectual property, but all of those pieces <coughs> have to be licensed, and we have to hold all of the right licenses from the people who have the authority to do that. If you contribute a patch, you hold the copyright to that code. You have to contribute it in such a way that we can legally distribute it. Okay? This is one of these things that we would all hate to think about. Uh, and that's why the PSF pays lawyers to think about it, so that we don't have to. Uh, but it is absolutely something that we need to have happen for, for the Python ecosystem to work. Uh, similarly, trademarks. Uh, so you've seen on all of my slides the sort of double snake uh, trademark thing. Uh, again, if if somebody wants to take that trademark, we have to protect that mark, or or it will lose its its value. So there is actually a committee working group of the PSF. If you want to use that trademark, if you want to use that trademark as it is for Python, which is what it's meant for, that's fine. If you want to change that and use it for a business or do something else, then you need to go to the Python Software Foundation to get authority for that. If not, they will sadly have to try to sue you. Uh, so that's, that's the idea. Uh, 
So, so that's the intellectual property part. It's not very glamorous. It's not very public. It needs to be done, though, and, and the PSF is the place that does that. Uh, we also have members. I want to talk a little bit about this because this is where um, things have changed in recent years. So um, I guess I need to ask, first of all, how many of you are members of the Python Software Foundation? Yeah, that's way too low. I'm sorry. Uh, so in fact, it used to be until a couple of years ago that to be a member of the Python Software Foundation, you had to be nominated by another member through a voting process. Uh, just again, I can't understand how I did that. But uh, so, uh, so all of that, a couple of years ago, we actually changed the way that the Python Software Foundation exists and the way that, that members can be added. So in fact, every single one of you in this room can, and dare I say should, be a member of the Python Software Foundation. All right, all that it takes to be a basic member is to go to the website and click on a web form and fill it out, and I promise we won't spam you. Every time somebody even talks about touching those email addresses, people go crazy. Uh, but, but all you do is give your email address, create an account on uh, python.org, and you are a member of the Python Software Foundation. Okay? Uh, this, this may not be a huge thing. I mean, I wouldn't go around, you know, we don't give you a membership card to flash it, it's whatever. It, it's, it's, it's expressing your support for the, for the PSF, for the language, for Python in general. Uh, and in fact, as the, if we have those numbers there, that, that tells us a lot about what our community is doing. So I, I strongly encourage you to do that. Uh, there are other types of members we've got. So there are sponsor members, which are companies that give money. And then, you know, the, 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 the voting membership sort of looks and says, do we want to be associated with this company or not? Yes, they're, they're good citizens of Python communities. They're in. Um, there are also other categories of membership where you actually are a full voting member. So there's a supporting member, uh, which is basically paying a subscription fee. Uh, and you'll need to go look at the subscription fee because I, 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 I now have two numbers in my mind and I don't want to say because I know I will pick the wrong one. Um, it's not a huge amount of money. Um, and that gives you voting rights. Uh, there is a, a, a category of contributing and managing members. So if you are actually working on a PSF project, part of a working group or things like that, uh, you then are a managing member of uh, the PSF uh, and are entitled to be a member. Uh, similarly, if you're working on either code or community activities, for the pipeline community, then you are a contributing member, or you rather, you are eligible to be uh, a contributing member to PSF, which means they can vote. All you need to do there is, first of all, go be a basic member on the Python.org website. Second, there is a form, and I, I've got some links at the end of this that will get you to where that form is. There is a form where you can go and fill it out and say, Yes, I actually spend five hours a month doing community stuff. Uh, and, and again, I would, I, would, I would be sure that you interpret this, how do I put this, somewhat generously. This is not meant to keep people out. If you go, oh, I don't know, I think it was only four and a half hours this month. No, that's good enough, honestly. Uh, but you can go and certify, self-certify there. Uh, no one will come and you know, come and inspect you or interrogate you or anything like that. We take your word for it. Uh, but that will give you the uh, ability, you know, to to vote uh, in PSF elections. So that that's another way that you can be a member. And then the final way is the old-fashioned way of being nominated and voting in, and that's still there. Although honestly, for the past year and a half, we have not done that. Uh, the Contributing and managing membership things seems to be uh, much more common now. Uh, so, so what happens with all of that is kind of the question. Um, so in running the PSF, the voting members basically select the board of directors. 
Uh, we can't have hundreds of people making day-to-day -day decisions or even month-to-month -month decisions. That, that, that's rather unruly. So the main thing that voting members can do is can, they can vote for people. And this is more important than you would think, particularly this year um, when, when I was elected to the board. Uh, we had, I think it was more than a 50% turnover in members of the board. This was driven by people in the community who wanted to to take things in a different direction and their voice was heard. So uh, you can in fact make sure that you've got the distribution, uh, the people there making the decisions that, that you would like. So again, voting members choose the board. The board then um, makes a lot of the other decisions. We, we meet every two weeks by both phone and IRC so we can see things and discuss things. Uh, and, and vote on, well, shall we do this, shall we do whatever. Uh, a large part of, of what we vote on, in fact, has to do with the money part of things. Uh, that is, the PSF has a certain amount of money, actually a fair amount of money, that, that we give to uh, various groups like this one uh, to do community uh, events. So, um, you know, a large part of what we do, as I say, is voting on this, shall we get in this? What's our policy going to be going forward on how we support all of these things? It's been a board policy for, for a few years now that we want to grow as many different ICON, uh, you know, groups in as many different locations as we possibly can. So, so that sort of thing then comes from the board and then yes, they say yes, you can have however many dollars it is to, to support your community like that. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, within the board there, there are officers. So Van Lindbergh is the president. We work for him. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the vice presidents. Uh, people think this is far grander than it is. In fact, being a vice president on the board means sort of like I get the third set of spare keys to let people in. Uh, no, we don't have a physical room, but it's in fact calling meetings. That's, that's what it means. I can call meetings. Okay. Uh, so, but we also have uh, Ava Gedluska, who is our Director of Operations, so she's a full-time officer of the PSF, uh, who runs a lot more of the day-to-day -day decisions, things that must be happen, must happen right now and need just a person in charge. Uh, we also have a bank coordinator, uh, Betsy Olsinski, who has just joined us, and she's helping in running things like Icon. Uh, and of course we have Kirk Kaiser as the treasurer who helps distribute all of this money to the various user groups and things like that. So those are all offices. And then finally we've got working groups which can in fact be any group of people that wants to work on something for the PSF. The one that, that um, Anna and I have started uh, is the uh, grants working group. The board was spending so much time doing every single grant uh, that in fact we decided to create a working group, we even talked Vicki into joining us, uh, to decide a lot of these issues uh, without involving the board directly. Basically the board delegates saying, we're gonna have a group of people, uh, so far we've got at least one from every continent other than Antarctica, we don't get any grant requests from Antarctica, strangely, uh, to who, who will meet and, and decide the issues of, you know, this looks like a fairly straightforward grant request. Nothing's requiring a special policy decision should it be granted, yes. Uh, and, and move that on through the system. So that's one. There is a working group uh, trying to bring a Python to Havana, Cuba. There, there are working groups doing lots of things. There's a scientific computing working group, various things. And anybody who wants to start a working group and is willing to go through some of the filling out a wiki page, things that need to be done, can then start that and, and, and get something going for uh, the PSF. And then finally with money, we get donations, we get sponsorships, we make a, uh, uh, a certain amount of money from Python US these days. What do we do with that money? Well, the uh, Python Software Foundation is sort of the backer for Python US. Uh, in the unlikely event of a global financial meltdown, not that that would ever happen, right? Uh, the PSF is, is responsible for picking up the slack if Python US uh, loses money. Uh, and in fact, it was during the global financial meltdown that, that they did lose money and that had to happen. Otherwise, usually Python US flows money the other way. Uh, as I say, we support a lot of other PyCons. 
Um, we, I think this year we'll be giving out somewhere in the neighborhood, and, and this is just a very vague number, but it's it's definitely over $100,000, more like uh, probably closer in the neighborhood, $150,000 for uh, meetups, uh, workshops, uh, icons like this one, uh, and things like that. We also occasionally fund uh, software projects that directly support um, the Python language. Uh, the latest one that we did support, we gave a little bit of money to develop, uh, basically to port some of the uh, Twisted testing apparatus uh, into Python 3, so that Twisted can now move more on into the Python 3 world. And of course, we have to pay a little bit for infrastructure as well, so that if you go to uh, you know, PyPI and want to download a package, there actually is something there, uh, so that the mailing lists work which I gather they haven't been working too well so far this weekend, but I don't know the details on that. Uh, and, and various things like that. So that's where the money goes. So that's a, that's a very whirlwind sort of tour through um, what the Python Software Foundation does. Um, we have, I think, a lot of opportunities before us as a community. Uh, I think we can do a lot in uh, the area of education. Uh, having been in the UK and, and being friends with Nicholas Tollerby, who's been sort of the person driving this, uh, in the UK they have developed a little tiny device called the Microbit, which is an ARM chip, little single board computer sort of thing, uh, that they are going to give in the UK to every 11-year-old in probably February, I think is the deadline now. It runs MicroPython. It also runs some other things, but it does run MicroPython, and that's going to be a key thing in it, so that uh, Python will be part of the UK educational experience going forward. Uh, that's an opportunity, that sort of thing, and with the Raspberry Pi and other things, is an opportunity that we need to see sort of everywhere. Uh, and not only education at that level, but of course, uh, bringing people who are more uh, adults into coding through things like Django Girls, etc. Those opportunities are there for us. Um, we, of course, you know, have a reputation as being uh, one of the better communities in the world of tech. We need to continue to build on that. Uh, as was mentioned in the opening, data science is, is huge. And um, more and more I meet people saying, well, I used to do a little bit of R, but it really looks like I've got to switch to Python because that's where all of the really cool stuff is happening in data science. Uh, this, this, this will be very good for us. And the whole world of scientific computing in general, too. I mean, a few years ago, I knew uh, an, an, an astronomy researcher who kept arguing that he didn't want to bother to learn Python because it just wasn't a scientific computing language. He's changed his mind by now. We need to keep changing minds on things like that. Um, but I mean, I think our challenges that, that we all face are, are sort of just the inverse of what I just said. Uh, we are growing as a community. We're growing here as a community in Ireland. We're growing as a community globally. We're growing virtually everywhere in the world. And growing communities is hard. Uh, scaling community involvement is tough. You cannot just have, again, the same two or three people leading a community as you continue to grow. Uh, they will burn out. Uh, other people will not have the opportunity to contribute. Uh, so one of the key things we need to do is figure out uh, and this, this is all of us need to figure out a way to keep people involved as our numbers grow. And, and how can we give a basically welcome that contribution that lets people be in, uh, you know, a, a full part of the community. Uh, it's, it's a great tragedy if somebody wants to help and then, you know, their offer is, I think the worst thing at all is they offer to help and it's just basically ignored because nobody can handle that request. That, that's the worst thing. That, that makes people head for the door. That's the thing that we have to worry about. Um, of course, we need to continue working on education and outreach. We need to do things in the language. We need to do things with, with, with pieces of software like Idle or some other code editor. There are many things we need to do to make education better. Uh, working out how to do packaging right would be nice for one. Uh, no, that's again, I'm, I'm sorry, but you go to people and they say, yes, how can I install this Python thing? It's like, well, the, the, you know, the, as you start to add stuff, it becomes difficult. So, uh, and it's a hard problem. I'm not just like trying to, 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 to 
gripe about it. It's a hard problem, but it is a big problem, I think, for, for uh, our continued adoption. Uh, and so in general, we just need to build better communities. And to do this, um, we, need, we need you to be involved. So you know, the first thing is to get involved with a community. And by getting involved, I mean making a contribution, as well as showing up, whether it is just setting up chairs, or uh, standing at the door directing people in the right direction, or, or you want to write code, or you're writing documentation, or you're working on putting on a conference, whatever it is you need to involved, uh, at whatever level works for you. Um, again, we need you to become a member of the PSF. It's really easy, I promise. If you have any trouble with it, I'll do it for you. Well, not uh, and uh, to do that, this is the link. Again, uh, PSF-landing is where you go to get the most stuff related to the PSF. Uh, that, that, that is the link that will actually put a little separate menu bar across the middle of the screen that has various things. Uh, and there is a PSF community mailing list that you would be asked to join as soon as you sign up. Uh, go ahead and join that. Uh, introduce yourself if you want. Uh, participate. Uh, we started the PSF community list just this summer in an effort to give people a, a, a forum to sort of get to know each other a little bit better. Uh, so please go, feel free to join in that. If you qualify, and okay, so I'm betting every single person who is on the uh, organizing team uh, qualifies, and then some, uh, you've given your time, sign yourself up as a voting member of the PSF. We need to have more voices involved there. And if you do all these things, what will we give you back? Well, I think pretty much the best community in the world. That, that, that kind of is what comes down to it. A community that wants your contributions uh, and uh, is a way to have some interesting friends around the world. So uh, this is the whole point of everything I've said up to this. Join us. Thank you very much.